Welcome to a salon uh, that's part of the American Philosophical Association series on congeniality uh, and the emergent discussion group neighborhood. Uh, I'm Jeremy Bendick Keemer, a professor of philosophy at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm calling in from Shaker Heights, Ohio, once land of many older nations. Uh, the land on, on which I live was ceded by 1,100 chiefs and warriors of uh, many Native American tribes in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, a treaty that was arbitrarily broken by the United States not long after it was made. Uh, this history is not irrelevant to the occasion of this salon. Susan Neiman's short book, Left is Not Woke, published this spring by Polity, and already a bestseller in the Netherlands, while currently being translated into Farsi, German, Korean, and Spanish. Susan is an American moral philosopher, cultural commentator, and essayist. She's written extensively on the juncture between enlightenment, moral philosophy, metaphysics, and politics. Uh, she currently lives in Germany, um, where she is the director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, um, although I believe she's uh, uh, calling in from another location. Uh, and in 2014, Susan was the recipient of the International Spinoza Prize, uh, and she delivered the Tanner Lecture on Human Values at the University of Michigan in 2010, uh, much awaiting a book that is supposed to come out um, about that, about hero from those lectures about heroism. Uh, in 2018, she was elected to the American Philosophical Society, receiving the Lucius D. Clay Medal for her contributions to German-American relations. Uh, her previous book, just before this one, was Learning from the Germans, Race, and the Memory of Evil, a wonderful book, wonderful book. And she's well known for her 2002 book, Evil in Modern Thought and Alternative History of Philosophy. Um, today, she will be joined by some of my friends from around the country. These include Catherine Casase, who is an international, uh, an intentional, excuse me, community member of the Simone Vey House in Portland, Oregon. Uh, she studied at Harvard College, where she also worked in homeless shelters and was involved in labor activism. Catherine has taught philosophy classes to middle school students and has written for the blog of the American Philosophical Association, the Cleveland Review of Books, uh, Environmental Ethics, and the Harvard Review of Philosophy. Uh, Susan was once an undergraduate and a graduate student at Harvard, and Catherine now speaks among today's college generation. Uh, also joining us is Julia Gibson, core faculty in the Environmental Studies Department at Antioch University, New England. Uh, they envision their research taking shape where the boundaries between feminist, political, and environmental philosophy grow pleasantly and productively murky. This research finds material, emotional, and spiritual expression on their family farm, located on unceded land within the traditional territories of the Wappinger and Munse Lenape peoples. In addition to brush hogging, berry picking, and chasing down cows, Julia's lived philosophical practice on the farm involves developing a multi-species ethics as part of intergenerational politics in the lands Julia calls home. Does Susan's critique of quote unquote woke politics speak to the concerns of someone as thoughtful and independent as Julia? Joining us here too is Stephen Rich, like myself, uh, a former student of Susan from Yale College in the 1990s. Stephen is the Maurice Jones Jr. class of 1925, professor of law at the University of Southern California's Gould School of Law, where he teaches courses in constitutional and statutory civil rights law, civil procedure, and race in the law. His published work includes scholarly articles on topics relating to diversity, affirmative action, and equal opportunity, with current research focusing on the relationship between dignity and legal process, new possibilities for a theory of equal opportunity, and legal concepts of personhood as they relate to a host of social issues, including social media, online identity, and pornography. He's proud to be the creator and inaugural instructor of USC's newest required course, Race, Racism, and the Law. Finally, we're lucky to have with us a contemporary of Susan from the Boston Metropolitan Area Graduate School scene of the 1970s and an expert in critical theory, Steve Vogel, is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Denison University, where he taught from 1984 to 2021. He has special research interest in environmental philosophy, the work of Jürgen Habermas and the Frankfurt School, and in Marxism, Hegel, and Heidegger. He is the author of the influential Thinking Like a Mall, Environmental Philosophy After the End of Nature, and Against Nature, the Concept of Nature in Critical Theory, 
Steve's published articles in uh, many leading journals for his field, as well as in Philosophy to get Today, Tikkun, and Descent. In 2003, he was awarded the Charles A. Brickman Award for Teaching Excellence at Denison. So these are our four interlocutors, and we're also joined by some members from the Emergent Discussion Group Neighborhood. They may raise a question or two at points throughout the discussion and throughout give us accountability outside our own bubble. All right, so what are we here to discuss? Like many of Susan's books, Left is Not Woke is an intervention into the present for the purposes of advancing social justice and critical thinking. To my mind, the moral core of the book is an urgent warning in the fight against the formation of fascist politics. I once claimed that Donald J. Trump was a quote unquote arbitrarian who opportunistically took advantage of fascist undercurrents of American culture, but who otherwise went with whatever would keep him free of accountability. I now think it's clear that Trumpism and increasingly the Republican Party in the US use what Jason Stanley calls quote unquote fascist tactics. In this nation state from where I speak and increasingly in many nations on earth, uh, fascist political movements or allied forms of authoritarianism and despotism are on the rise and digging in. DeSantis's attack on the quote unquote woke in Florida, a move echoed in my own home state of Ohio, is a fascist tactic or a set of them. Attacking the basis of critical thinking, truth and education while dog whistling nationalist purity. What Susan's book does in my view is to urgently raise the question of whether social justice culture in the US but also elsewhere is adequately prepared to fight fascist tactics here and now. The irony is that quote unquote woke culture as she reconstructs it appears unable to do so but an old school left universalism indebted to the enlightenment by contrast is ready. So let's now turn to Susan and what she has to say. Uh, Susan, thank you again for coming here. And um, here's the first question. Uh, what were you trying to do with left is not woke? And what have you learned through the process? So Jeremy, thank you. This is, um, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, this discussion very much. Um, you actually got pretty well what I was trying to do in your little introduction in, in foregrounding the problem of fascism. And I should say that I see things having spent more of my adult life outside of the US than in it, I see things in a sort of relentlessly international perspective, which doesn't mean that I have an angle on every country or, uh, you know, certainly I don't speak enough languages to do as much as I would like, but I live in international communities and I see, number one, that there is an international uh, fascist turn. Um, I worry a lot about Israel. There's a major minister in the state government who uh, describes himself as fascist. Uh, the recent attempt to destroy the justice system combined with the uh, organization of non-state, well, state but not official militias to murder people uh, in the occupied territories is horrendous, as is the chasing down of so-called enemies of the state. I have Indian friends who inform me about just what Modi's government for whom both Biden and Macron just laid out the red carpet for are doing, and they call it genocidal, all right? Um, and so I, you know, I have been learning about that. I have been, because we're fairly close to Russia and the Ukraine in Berlin, where I mostly live, I know a lot of people who are either Russian dissidents who've left or um, Ukrainians who have left. And, you know, if what Putin is doing isn't fascism, I don't know what is, all right? So, and the, the very interesting thing about this is that they're all very well connected. They literally meet with each other and learn from each other. Steve Bannon holds meetings of people in uh, in Europe with uh, you know far right parties, and it's of course pathetic <laughs> that uh, you know left wing groups do not have the same kind of solidarity that um, that these far right proto-fascists have. 
And I suppose my concern and what drove me to write this was to say, look, um, and I say this towards the end of the book, um, we know what happened in 1933. Um, the fascists did not have a majority. Uh, the majority would have come from the left-wing parties had they worked together. And instead, the left is tearing itself up on over questions of ideological purity and, um, you know, small, what Freud called the narcissism of small differences. Um, so that's the background. And by the way, the other thing is that um, people often say that woke is either an American phenomenon or it's a generational phenomenon. I don't think either of those things are true. It started, I believe, in American colleges and universities, but it's <laughs> migrated pretty quickly and pretty thoroughly. I, I mean, I, I was gobsmacked when, you know, the Portuguese and the Koreans, not to mention the Iranians, wanted to buy this book, but they do. It's obviously, you know, um, it's coming out in two weeks in Germany with a lot of interest. And of course, it's the German scene that I know best. Um, and it's by no means confined to students. It's very much a, um, you know, the, the gatekeepers, people in publishing, people who run uh, cultural institutions, um, people in their 50s and early 60s, um, very much don't want to lose, if they're, you know, consider themselves progressive, don't want to lose the connection to what they think young people want to hear, read, see, etc. Um, so you have that phenomenon. At the same time, you have this, uh, many, many people, and not only in my generation, who tell themselves and each other in conversations where they feel they're, they're safe, gee, I guess I'm not left anymore. And it was that, you know, it was having a, several conversations like that with people that prompted me to suddenly say, um, no, you're left, you've always been left, what's going on right now, and somebody would name some particular incident, is not left. So the book really, I know a couple of people wanted me to say more and give examples about what woke is. Um, the book is actually much more interested in defining what left is rather than what woke is. Um, and that's what I try to do. I don't claim to be um, exclusive or anything like that, but I came up with three principles that would apply both to liberals and leftists, because I think we need as big a tent as possible, given that I think the danger of fascism is, is extremely real. And then one principle that distinguishes the left from liberals, um, and none of those things actually have anything to do with woke except, and we can get into this with um, a couple of people now, I'm not sure that I've made notes about everybody's um, criticisms or questions, um, except in so far as many people who are woke, and let's make, let's, let's agree from the start that although no one anymore calls themselves woke, it's just become a term of abuse that's used by the right. Although interestingly enough, it wasn't five years ago. I can remember um, sitting at a uh, workshop with uh, Amiya Srinivasan and talking about um, whether woke, we decided that woke was a good word five years ago, okay, that it was, you know, that it, it had the right kinds of um, intonations and sort of emotional push to be a better word for progressive, but it's turned into something that it wasn't five years ago. And uh, I, I think it's become um, not only tactically problematic, it is tactically problematic. I have met people, not too many, because it's not my crowd. I fortunately, uh, you know, I don't hang out with people who would ever be tempted to vote Republican, say, or, um, you know, for the AfD in Germany. But I know many, many people who feel politically homeless, disengaged, and unwilling to be active because when they try to do so, 
they are put off by and sometimes directly called out for something um, that goes against a certain um, a certain ideology of what's um, what's uh, uh, let's call woke for a second. Now, so there's a tactical problem, okay? And the tactical problem is not small. For example, in Germany, the AfD, our right-wing party, is now polling at 20%. That makes it the second highest, um, you know, the second most popular party in the country. This is awful, okay? It's really awful. But um, if someone says, "From I'm voting for that party because... I think the fact that I cannot live on my pension is more important than arguing about gender language. I have to agree with them, okay? And I should point out that, um, as I say very briefly in the book, one of the interesting things about fights over gender language um, is that they work entirely differently in different countries because different languages do gender very differently. So what yeah, appears... Yeah sexist to me um, is something that appears feminist to somebody who's only thinking in a German context. Anyway, sorry, I, okay, you want to, um, I'm going to stop in a second. I said I was going to be brief. Yeah, um, I, let yeah me just... no, it's okay. I'd like, I'd like to, if you could back up and just say a little bit about the three principles of the left, the one principle that subdivides, and if you can say a little bit more about the ideology of woke, but then we could also turn it over to um Yeah, let's turn it over to because they were yeah. good questions. Um, sure. So tactically, I think that um, you know, progressives are uh, not doing what they need to do to fight genuine right wing, um, the rise of of proto fascist parties by focusing on those kinds of issues and by alienating uh, people who normally would have been on their side. But I think it's not an accident. This is not just a tactical thing. I'm not telling people, you know, they're different. Uh, let's, let's think about priorities here. Voting rights are more important, say, than pronouns. And let's pull back um, I don't want to. I don't want to get into a pronoun fight, but um, certain kinds of ling linguistic rules. Let's pull back on that for a while until we win the battle against fascism, and then we can go on to talk about something else. I think what this reveals, and that was what I'm, what was most interesting to me to try to figure out in this book, reveals is that while the emotion of the woke are traditionally progressive emotions. You want to be on the side of the oppressed. You want to be on the side of the marginalized. You want to try as far as you can to right historical wrongs. And what's confusing about the woke is that all of those emotions are there and I, I'm sympathetic to them. And I think um, most people are exactly, you know, after my own heart, as it will, but not after my own head, because it turns out that they're motivated by theories that undermine actually these progressive emotions. So I tried to boil it down to three principles that both liberal and leftist share. One is you're committed to universalism rather than tribalism. Um, the second is that you're committed to um, a hard distinction between justice and power, even if you can't always make that distinction in practice, you believe that you ought to try to. And the third is that you have a robust conception of progress, not um, 
you know, in this character that you often hear, people thought, used to think that progress was inevitable and necessary and look at Auschwitz and Hiroshima and we see that it's not and the climate crisis. Um, nobody who came up with an idea that progress is possible through the efforts of people working together ever thought it was inevitable on the contrary, okay? But that it's possible. Um, and that it's happened in the past, okay? That there are models of things actually improving in people's lives um, is something that both leftists and liberals share. And finally, um, what distinguishes the left from the liberal, in my point of view, is that for leftists, uh, social rights are genuine rights, and they're just as important as uh, the right to freedom of speech or travel or whatever. They're not benefits, they're not privileges, they are genuine rights, okay? And you can argue about uh, how one wants to get to a society good, good, good. which genuinely acknowledges them all, but um, it's, I'm, I'm, I was really trying to um, really trying to write a short book that doesn't talk about cancel culture, doesn't give examples of things that really quite a number of books have already done. And you know, certainly every four days you can read in some newspaper or or blog or another, but really trying to get at what the philosophical principles are. And um when I when I mean to, as uh, Steve put it, when I mean to Foucault or um, a few other people, I don't mean to suggest that every everybody who's woke has sat down and studied um, any of these theorists. I'm suggesting that they are, and the reason that I didn't give examples of woke theorists using them, as I, but I rather gave a couple of newspaper uh, recorders, is to show that these are not, you don't have to study theory uh, in order to have picked up on a set of philosophical assumptions. They're mm -hmm. in the Great. culture, they're all over the place. And the last thing I should say, Jeremy, is I didn't actually set out to write a book at all, <laughs> or this book. I was working on the book you want me to work on, the Heroes book, which I I filled out some more in, in uh, I gave the Gifford lectures last year in Edinburgh. And so I filled that out some more and I, I, I was planning to do that, but I also gave, this is my second Tanner lecture at uh, the University of Cambridge was this book. And, you know, going into it, I just wanted a chance to try and work out some stuff that I had been confused about and that um, perhaps, as one review said, it's a good thing she's not an American university. She couldn't publish it if she were. I'm not sure that that's true, but perhaps it is. Um, uh, so I just thought, OK, I'll I'll. I'll give one lecture and they can throw tomatoes at me if they like, um, because Cambridge is a very woke place. And that will be that. And to my great surprise, people really liked it. They really felt that they had not heard a critique of woke from the left. And they encouraged me and Polity came to me and said, you know, you want to write a, a short book on the subject? And I said, yeah. Um, but Good, you good. Know, some of the good questions that people asked didn't fit within the framework of a short book. Well, uh, let, let's let them fit into the framework now. Um, yeah, sure. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have freewheeling discussion, but um, we're going to make a, give a chance for um, each of our four um, uh, guests to um, kind of lead in with some of the questions they've been having. So. Um, Stephen uh, Rich, I wonder if you uh, feel like you'd like to lead Absolutely. in right now. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, Jeremy, thank you for, for inviting me to join this conversation. And I, I know that you knew that it would be special to me in a lot of ways and, and that I would have an interest in it because, of course, we, we took a course um, together from, um, some a little while ago um, from, from Susan that touched on a lot of these topics. And I guess I want to start by um, re re-examining or re or reliving uh, a lesson that 
I took from this course, and I and I I'm still going to attribute it to to Susan. Maybe that'd be part of a longer conversation. But the lesson is that the Enlightenment's most um, most intentional, most direct, most powerful critics are themselves still work, operating within um, the Enlightenment's tradition. That they're not severed from the tradition, and that in fact the Enlightenment or those of us who who continue to hold to what we what we feel are enlightenment values have a lot to learn about the enlightenment tradition from those from those critics and Foucault was one of those critics in fact I, I still I will still say that the place where I started reading Foucault and and developed a desire to continue was the students course now here we are and, and the book as I read it really s seeks to sever that relationship between at least some of the Enlightenment's most intentional and forceful critics and the Enlightenment itself. And I'm, and I'm sort of sitting here, been sitting here for a while now trying to figure out um, exactly why. And another reason why it puzzles me is, is, of course, because the left has this tradition of embracing its critics too, right? And so I, I could read Left is Not Woke as a kind of combination of Kant's groundwork for the metaphysics of morals and Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. I, I can I can think of, of Marx's relationship to, to the left and say, well, Marx has been used by the left to kind of cultivate a sense of humanistic socialism, but in fact, Marx himself had a lot of hum, anti-humanistic, um, and one could say, one could criticize his pseudoscientific elements in his own thinking that became fodder for author, authoritarianism later on. And so if the, if the Enlightenment can be conceived of as able to reason with and embrace its own critics. And the left can be conceived of as able to um, interact with, absorb, and learn from ideologies that meet it in a state of confrontation than what's going on here. Um, and one possibility is, is that the severing of the, um, the, the severing of the Enlightenment's critics from the Enlightenment here is also severing them from the left. And I wonder if that may be part of what's important here and why that might be important to you. Why would it be important that, um, that we not see Foucault as contributing to, to leftist thinking? And the, and the last sort of reverberation of that question is, what is exactly the left's role in, in the creation of or the cultivation of wokeness? Right. If 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 the left, in fact, had a relationship that was ongoing, as the Enlightenment would have a relationship that's ongoing with Foucault, for example, then we'd also be thinking about how the left or what sort of responsibility the left bears for the woke, too. Um, do you want me to respond? I would love you to respond. That's OK. Yeah, um, thank you, Stephen. Um, let's see, the left's role in the cultivation of the woke. I mean, so look, here's what I think, and I say this in the book, the woke did right, okay? Um, and as it were, enlarged the perspective of traditional they reminded us that even if we were universalists in principle, we were thinking more of white than brown, more of male than female, more of more straight than gay, even if we would, you know, sort of allow ourselves, you know, remind ourselves, oh yeah, yeah, of course it applies to everybody. But we weren't conscious enough of that. And it's good that we became more conscious of that. I would argue though, that those are principles that grew out of, you know, more traditional left movements in the 60s, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and the, the gay rights movement. So, you know, um, but insofar as that increased our awareness, that was a good thing. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think it's made us do recently is make us more aware of colonialism and the pervasiveness of that. Howsomever, you said, uh, one of the things that you wrote, you wrote something that you didn't just say, you said, why, why did I look at other people, including 
uh, trauma theory and post-colonialism? And the answer was, don't know them well enough. And I wanted to write a short book. However, I have been quite influenced by um, friends and one person in particular who I quote in the book, an Indian historian named Benjamin Zachariah, who's working on the fascist roots of post-colonialism. Um, and he has a book that'll be coming out with polity soon. So, um, and I just don't know that territory. I could, you know, spend a couple of years uh, diving into it and write something. But since there are some other people starting to do that, I'm very glad. But I think it's I think it's absolutely important. I mean, if you realize, for example, that um, people like Modi are at this point saying, don't talk to me about human rights. It's a Eurocentric concept. We have our own. Uh, and besides, you guys colonized us. Um, these are our traditions, um, you know, and I mean, it just happens to be the largest country in the world, but that's something that Mugabe did in uh, Zimbabwe and um, other people. So there's a there's been a real problematic way in which post-colonial theory, which you're absolutely right to say is part of woke theory, um, can be distorted. And the question is, what are the roots of that? What are the theoretical roots of of the theories that allow for that kind of distortion. And again, I said, I'm going to look back at the notes from that seminar, which was what, let's see, do we want to figure out how many, 30 years ago? 30-ish years, yeah. Yeah, 30 years ago. And and see what I, um, what I thought at the time, and hopefully what I'm thinking now is better, but you never know. I mean, it's better worked out. Um, and I suppose I I would say still that in terms of affect, people like Foucault certainly are relying on enlightenment tropes and enlightenment traditions. And that's partly what's confusing about them. But the more you look into them, the more I have come to believe that they're actually, I mean, the affect may be there, but the philosophical assumptions that we need are not. But maybe I should save that because I know Steve thinks I'm being mean to Foucault. He's not the only person. So I want to get into that discussion later. Okay. Well, we can, we can table Foucault for, um, for now. And I, let me just get back into the question of affect then for a little bit, because there's, there's another point that you make in the book that's um, consistent with this, right? Which is, which is that the, the, the woke, um, in a sense, have their hearts or at least their emotions in the right place, that being interested in the welfare of those who are disadvantaged is the right place to start, but that they end up somehow in the wrong place. I'd love to hear more from you about how it is that you think they end up in the wrong place? Is it really just their their reliance on these other thinkers that you also acknowledge many of them will not have read? Or is it some other pathway? So let's, um, let's first address the question, but have they read them or not? Um, often, um, I mean, Discipline and Punish is the most read book by anyone who goes to college and doesn't, I mean, book of philosophy, or theory, and doesn't specifically study philosophy, okay? That's if you read one book, um, you'll read that. But supposing you didn't read that book and you do go to college, um, you will, um, you're your teacher will have read that book and will have absorbed certain assumptions in particular. Now we have to get into Foucault's and I, I don't know if we, <laughs> to answer well, your, your question. Yeah, let, we, can, you wanna... we can circle, we can circle back to it when we get to um, Steve Vogel. I, I want to, I wonder if, um, if it might be good just to get a, an, a another mix in there but but uh steve i i wanted to was there a particular part not on the foucault part that you wanted a, an answer to at this point well sure um i guess what what i was what i was driving at here is that to the extent that 
woke politics is um, it's it's very fast. It's very reactive. It's 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 often very highly emotionally charged. The things that make us feel that way, the things that make us feel that we have to react defensively and quickly, the things that make us really, really angry, the things, the things that make us want to lash out and cancel and be angry before we sit and reason and be deliberate and include someone else in a, in a conversation in a respectful way, um, they tend to be very close and not far away. They tend to be very, very close to where we are. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have a sense that there isn't something else that's really very close to the to the woke that is inspiring this kind of political reaction. Um, it's a really good question. I don't know whether you have something in mind. I mean, first off, I would say um, one always gets angrier at the people one feels you know, are one's own people, as it were. I mean, I know that I still get more outraged, as long as I haven't lived there, I still get more outraged at, you know, crimes that go on in America as than I do at other ones. There's a sense of betrayal. Um, you know, if, if somebody who you think is fundamentally on your side, um, as it were, doesn't see something so simple as, as you know, whatever, whatever it is, there is a sense of anger. But I don't have a, I don't have more of an answer than that. Do you? Do you have a, a well, guess? I, I, so I, so I'm a lawyer by training, right? So I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm doing that, um, doing that thing that I do a little, a little bit too much. Um, but I do, I do have an idea in mind. It's, it's in the sense, it's the left itself. Right. So in, in a sense, what it is, is, is ang anger at the failures of the left to solve the problems that they themselves have inherited and now are being said that told that they're responsible for. And that the only way they can shake responsibility for racism and the only way they can shake responsibility for sexism and for homophobia and for other things is to is to is to be very, very demonstrative in the way that they disavow them. Right. And 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 so that, I think, is is missing right that sort of relationship between what came before in the left and the woke and how the woke are responding to that is yeah. something that's that's missing that's missing from the book um and i wouldn't say i mean i, I so I, because i am sympathetic with the with the project of reintroducing political conversation to enlightenment values i i and i and i'm sympathetic with the idea of writing a short book i understand <laughs> the, those <laughs> those uh, borders that you had to operate within. But at the same time, reconciliation with the woke, between the woke and the left, and inclusion of the woke or conversion of the, lo of the woke to the left isn't possible, I don't think, without repairing that relationship, if I'm right, that part of what has happened here is a fracturing. Okay, so, so very, very quickly. Um, yeah, I, actually, I think, I think actually Catherine's question, this might, if we could get Catherine's question, and I think you'll be able to speak to both. Um, sorry to interrupt. I'm just mindful of time. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to just briefly <laughs> respond or do you want to wait? My, my gut is, is that Catherine's question will lead us right into this uh, okay. issue. Yeah, it, it's certainly related. Um, yeah, thank you, Susan and Stephen, for that. Um, I, I'm possibly coming at it from a slightly different side, though, that I, I'm lucky enough to see progressive politics with, with rose-colored glasses, I think, mostly because I am not online <laughs> or i'm not on social media very much um so but my question really is how how is woke ideology carried out by activists in their concrete practices of organizing um i'm especially interested in this in the first two chapters um how um like woke activists ideas about um power and justice in 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 group politics really is affecting the sort of like activism they engage in okay um no it's not quite the same question but let me try answering um stevens first um, yeah also if if i could just uh, catherine also i remember over email you would also i may have misunderstood you you were curious about how things would differ on the ground with organizing if one were to take kind of Susan's 
principled outlook of left universalism and put it alongside woke organizing. Is that, did I do oh, that right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so in other words, it speaks to Steve's question because there's a question about what it would be for these two different forms of organizing to coexist um, and what would be needed for them to uh, work together or whether there'd be fundamental differences and that, that was, that's how I was thinking of it. So let me first say to Stephen's question real quickly, um, I, I think the historical answer to um, how did we get where we are, that there was this break between the old left and the woke, is that the old left collapsed in 1991. We, all of us, there was never a serious international conversation, little groups, yes. What went wrong? Why did state socialism collapse? Is this the end of history? Um, you know, and it just it just didn't take place. Everybody, uh, I mean, I, I I know many many people who had spent decades arguing what kind of a socialist they were, who all of a sudden said, you know, oh God, I guess it all led straight to the gulag. All right, so we all bought into um, the idea that there was no socialist project. Uh, no internet. I mean, and socialism is fundamentally internationalist. This was the problem with Stalin. Um, fundamentally universalist. Okay, um, and once that collapsed, those of us who couldn't, you know, get rid of our left wing leanings, focused on these much smaller scaled questions of how can I help fight discrimination to one particular tribe. We can talk about the word tribe if we want to later. I'd actually enjoy, well, let me just, let me, here, here is something. I, I, Jeremy is not the only person who's who's come at me about the use of the word tribe, okay? Um, a number of people have also called me on it. Um, and for a bunch of I think partly similar reasons to the ones that Jeremy called me on, including a discussion recently in Berlin of the book uh, with an African American who wanted to say he's a member of the Yoruba tribe and it's a good thing and we don't want to call this. Um, um, someone, also a um, person of color, sent me most recently or tweeted recently um, a quote of Baldwin's. Uh, asking, you know, are we ever going to transcend this tribalism? And I sort of said, well, wait a sec. If Baldwin uses it, Baldwin, who's practically a saint at this point in cultural history, is it now kosher? Can I say tribalism too? And this there goes goes back to Catherine's question. Yeah, um, the um, the idea that your positionality is the only thing that gives you a right to speak. And people who do not have the right positionality have no right to speak. Um, you know, regardless of what they're saying is, um, is something that you see all the time in woke discourse. Now, I grant you, if you're talking about mm -hmm. activism, I agree that the people who I know, who are really social act justice activists on the ground doing stuff, do less of this than people in the sort of academic or cultural world agreed, okay? Um, but it spills over into activism. And I have been told by many people um, who are trying to set up new forms of left-wing political parties that positionality questions or what I would call tribalist questions are tearing up, you know, the solidarity that's needed to get a forceful political party or political movement off the ground. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it certainly does. And I, I appreciate the like the focus or, or, or noting that um, yeah, those problems are, are more common in, in academia, or I think online is really important to say too, or in corporations is something you talked about in the book, World Corporations. But I, I'm still curious about the nature of this spillover. Um, you, you touched on it a bit in the introduction, but like, what are the, like, still, what are the ways in which 
um, you know, these these theories, including positionality you just mentioned, are affecting on the ground politics. I'm just not sure I, I see it as much. Um, you know, first of all, when you say academics, I want to make sure that this is not, I'm not talking academics, academics in terms of what, you know, people argue in their common rooms. Um, I'm talking about anybody who has a college degree and goes on to work for a publishing company, uh, a news journal, um, a cultural organization. It's big. It's not, it's not a niche problem. Okay. How does it affect things? In uh, look, here's an example. <laughs> um, and I know there'll be people who will disagree with me. One of the reasons that we're having uh, so much trouble in Germany um, right now, and that the current coalition is is polling so badly that uh, you know a right wing reactionary group is um, you know ahead of us. Germany has does coalition politics, um, which means that um, most governments are formed by two parties, sometimes three. Okay. Now, in the last election, the Green Party decided. So, what we have now is a is a social democrat, a, a Green Party, and unfortunately, a sort of libertarian, neoliberal party. Okay. It's got uh, about 11%, but has a uh, huge uh, influence in basically stopping all of the progressive policies that the Social Democrats and the Greens would like to do. Why do we have this party? Um, during the last election, the Greens were leading by a lot. And they, the left-wing parties in Germany, have decided that they want a double chair, one man, one woman. The female chair of the Green Party is in every possible way a worse politician than the male was, okay? Um, she's less qualified, <laughs> less experienced. Uh, when she wrote a campaign book, it turned out to be uh, plagiarized. Well, his his book is, you know, he's a he's a writer, very good, very charismatic politician with all the right, you know, thoughts. and it was decided by the Green Party that no, um, there had to be a female candidate, and she bombed. Okay. Um, now, not so bad, but it was it was all foreseeable, right? It really this is not this is not something that oh by the way they were both kind of seen equally, but one made a bunch of campaign mistakes. It was clear that if you were going to take the best candidate, the best candidate would have been the guy. And I say this as a woman and a feminist. Okay, so what happened? Um, the combination of the Greens and the Greens, you know, lost sort of 15 percent of what they were initially polling. And what that meant is that the Social Democrats and the Greens did not have enough to um, uh, form a government by themselves because it had to be over 50 percent. So they took had to take on somebody else to form a coalition and the somebody else has blocked every single progressive policy that they have tried to put through. So the government looks like meh. I understand if you don't think further back about what this coalition would do, eh, this government isn't doing anything. You know, they can't even pass a budget. By the way, we it took them six months to pass a budget for next year. We still don't have an exact one, okay? Um, so, I mean, that's an example of, you know, very real instances where a commitment to um, gender parity has really screwed up the politics of the country that I live in, and that is, after all, the most powerful country in Europe. Great. Catherine, do you mind if I um, just move around the table uh, briefly? We can come back to this as needed. Um, mm -hmm. So. Steve Vogel, I wonder if you feel like jumping in at this point or where you are. 
Um, I'm right here. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, and thanks, thanks, Susan, and thanks, and thanks to Jeremy for for setting this up. Um, you know, it, it, I'm. I wrote this. I wrote last night something about why are you so mean to, to Foucault. Um, I'm not actually a Foucauldian, uh, you know, I, but I but I like his work. Um, and and somehow when I was reading what you had to say about him, I, I thought no, but I mean that's not what that's not what he's saying. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't. I'm not interested in in kind of uh, at this point, especially given the time constraints, talking about who's got the right interpretation of Foucault. That's that that's a conversation for another time. Um, but but I guess there's a way that you write about him and some of the others, Adorno too. I won't say anything about Schmidt because I I, I don't you know he just seems like a bad guy. Um, but but um, wh whereby you you sort of concede a couple of times in the book that actually these figures, people like Foucault, are more complicated than you're saying, and that there are other ways of reading him, and and it's sort of that that I want to ask about and push you maybe a little bit. Of, on because because you sort of suggest at least my and the way I read the book a couple of times that maybe maybe Foucault or people like him or, or Adorno are too complicated maybe maybe a little too hard to understand and that you're you're sort of responding as you said here a couple of times to the way in which he's sort of become part of the culture or especially academic culture way, ways in which these folks have been in a sense maybe misread by the by the woke community and you you make a sort of appeal a couple of times to the to the idea of common sense that the views um, that, that Foucault's views or the, the views of others like him are, are just not the sort of everyday wisdom we expect grown-ups to have as you put it at one point um it's almost a kind of appeal to ordinary language uh which and and what I want to say is that this stands in a kind of contrast with, with a sort of tradition on the left which goes back to Marx I think um, that actually says that in an unjust and exploitative society, what counts as common sense and as the set of unquestionable views that you know grown-ups take for granted might be wrong, and that a radical you know political critical theory um, inevitably has to be one that seems sort of strange and difficult to ordinary grown-ups, um, which also means that that it, it could mean that that what seems like a a, a progressive policy actually presupposes a set of ideas, a kind of ideology that actually isn't progressive and perpetuates the very sort of injustice that it claims to overcome. I think that's what Foucault is saying about prison reform. He's not saying that it's better to be drawn and quartered than to, than to be in prison. I don't think he thinks that, or, nor even that it's, that it's identical, but that perhaps there are things involved in, in uh, you know, contemporary prisons um, which don't actually liberate people and which actually do presuppose certain sorts of things or, or, or perpetuate certain kind of presuppositions that are actually part of the problem you know, that, that, that we face. Um, so I guess my, my question is something like, you know, isn't, it, isn't it possible that, that an appropriate understanding of our, you know, the sort of, yes, pre-fascist possibly situation today is going to be difficult, is going to be complex, and is going to be tough for ordinary adults to agree with this sets up a whole set of other problems because if you're if you believe in democracy the question is going to be how you get ordinary adults to agree with it that's that's a significant issue but i guess i, I want to i guess i want to push you against this sort of appeal to what ordinary people understand um that you that you refer to several times so i'm just interested in your reaction to that all right, thanks very much. And of course, you're right, and I agree that often um, philosophy, and particularly left wing philosophy, uh, you know, requires us to question what we take for granted. And if philosophy is good for anything, it's good for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when talking about banality, I was quoting one of my favorite philosophical writers who's not that well known um, in in the US certainly, Jeanne Marie. Um, and um, you know, one of the interesting things about Amarie's discussion of um of Foucault is that he actually was tortured by the Gestapo and uh spent two years in Auschwitz and other prisons. So I mean when when Amarie talks about the ordinary. Okay, he is, say, you know, 
that that's the background, okay, of of his writing and the claim that uh, Damien would have preferred the panopticon to being drawn and quartered is, you know, it is, I, I feel like what Foucault does is to sneer at, at normative questions, all right, all the time, as if, who could be so tacky as to ask, are you for or against the Enlightenment? Who could be so tacky as to ask, you know, um, so are you saying we should go back to drawing and quartering? Of course he's not, all right? And of course he's, but why doesn't he ask that question if he knows that he's leaving the reader? And this is not a question of a bad reader or a good reader, because I'm a pretty good reader, I think. Um, and I've read and taught some of these books before. Um, I, I think in your notes that you said yesterday, you said it's clear that he hates the panopticon. Well, of course he does, and so do I. And, and you know, do I think there's a lot, uh, you know, I we don't have to get into the question about whether prisons need to be abolished or is there a way that they can be changed uh, right now. But, you know, to say that that there's, uh, you know, contemporary prisons, especially in the United States, are abominable is, is basically to say a banality, okay? Um, but the question is, what does he leave us with at the end of that? He leaves us with the fact that um, the attempt to reform the penal system from torturing people to death to putting them in the panopticon was a failure because uh, it resulted in a more uh, insidious form of subjugation. And he leaves you with no way out. Moreover, I think it's important, and uh, there, there's been work done on this, uh, people actually asked Foucault about prison reform and how to apply his his uh, um, you know his critique to something that would be of use to people in prisons, and he thought that was trivial. He, he just you know that's he was not interested in uh, bettering the lives of ordinary prisoners at all. Now, um, what I wanted to say, Steve, is you are not the first person who um, who accused me of being mean to Foucault. And I did um, give the manuscript of this book to about um, 10 friends of mine, a very different, uh, different kinds of people, different, yeah, interests, different generations, all that stuff. Um, all of whom are thanked in the acknowledgments. And um, one of the people who said I was too mean to Foucault was, I think he was the only philosopher I asked to read this book, maybe. I don't know, was he? Um, Phil, Philip Kitcher, my friend, who said I was too mean to, to Foucault. And he had once talked with Foucault for three hours and Foucault said that um, uh, all of his work was done in the service of liberation. Um, it's of interest to note, by the way, that um, Philip's wife, Pat, who's also a distinguished philosopher, completely disagreed with her husband on this point, but okay. So, but but on Philip's urging, I went back and I read both some more Foucault and, um, and also some discussion of Foucault by Foucauldians. And one thing that I read, which was the most interesting, was his analysis of neoliberalism, which I think is kind of mistakenly called the biopolitics lectures. And I was struck by how good and how prescient his analysis of what neoliberalism has done to our souls is. Um, it's particularly since it was written, I believe in 1980, it's, it's very, very good. Okay. So I think, okay, this is good. Then I go and I try and read some secondary literature by Foucauldians. There's an entire book on, um, on that subject. They could not agree whether he was for or against neoliberalism. You know, and and that just is so striking to me, um, and and it's so typically Foucault. 
that, and that's, I suppose, what I mean by common sense. Common sense for me says, if you are talking about a phenomenon as, you know, powerful and, you know, in my view, deleterious to the human soul as neoliberalism, damn it, take a position and take a position that people can understand, particularly if they were people, or all of the people in this collection had, you know, spent a good part of their lives writing about Rousseau. So, sorry, Foucault. Um, so, so that's my, you know, I, I, I stand by I, I, uh, my problems with him. And, and also particularly when you look at the stuff that he writes on power, I tried really hard to say, okay, power is a metaphor and he doesn't really mean it in this sort of violent um, warlike way that we tend to associate it with. And then you read certain passages where he absolutely does. I know he claimed he wasn't systematic. I know, you know, and I, I allow, totally allow for people to change their views. But um, then I'd like to say, hey, I've changed my view and this is why. I forgot, Jeremy, but I, I, I want to stop talking right now and, and let um, Julia say something because, but there is, um, you said something kind about my book, Left is Not, uh, no, not left is not woke. Um, learning from the Germans, because of things that have happened in the last couple of years, uh, I have changed some of my views in that book, and I'm in the process of trying to write a long essay on that. But um, that is part of what made me um, write this book. Is um, maybe I can have a minute later on to say something about that. But I think it's Julia's turn. Right. Yeah, let's let's keep I think let's keep pressing on complexity a little bit. I actually on the ground practical relational complexity, but I don't want to antici over anticipate Julia. What, what do you think, Julia? You good to go? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been enjoying listening. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in our conversation, lots of threads to pick up on. Um, I guess I want to. I don't know if this is, this is both a backtrack and a moving forward, hopefully in the way that you'd like, Jeremy. Um, I, I don't know who the woke is and I don't want to spend too much time sort of like hashing out the details of it. But what concerns me here is that I agree, Susan, that like no one's using that term to self-identify anymore. Like it has been because of the way that it's been tarnished, I guess, by um, right-wing vilification, right? And has become something of a caricature. Um, so if we're not talking about the word woke or like a self-identification of wokeness, then what are we talking about? And it seems like there we have to think about what's the stand-in? Like what is standing in for woke here if we're not attaching it to the word? And a lot of the things that are functioning as stand-ins for wokeness as sort of like an amalgamation of things really concern me. Um, there are things like, this is both in the book and sort of in our conversations prior to this meeting. Um, so things like identity politics, standpoint theory, allyship, intersectionality, queer theory, decolonial theory, trauma theory, like those are a really powerful set of theories and practices that come from, um, I mean, a lot of them come from black thought and black activism, like others come, not that these are exclusive communities, but from queer thought and queer activism. And I'm, I'm concerned about, um, the oversimplified versions of these things getting taken up, meaning that we're throwing them out. Um, and I wanna connect this to something that we started off the conversation with, which was the idea that voting rights are more important than pronouns, right? And we have this and other linguistic rules. Um, and on the first page of the book, we get this. What distinguishes the left from the liberal is the view that along with political rights that guarantee freedoms to speak, worship, travel, and vote as we choose, 
We also have claims to social rights, which undergird the real exercise of political rights. I really worry that when we are throwing out sort of that list of things that come from um, queer and BIPOC scholarship and activism and lived, lived experience, that we get a real oversimplification of what the left can be. Um, and we end up back with liberalism because that's, I mean, we end up back with, you know, voting rights are more important than pronouns. Sit down. We have this to focus on first before we can get to that other stuff, that other social stuff that's less important. Um, and so I wanted to focus my question on there's a conversation which I think is interesting and um, rich about um, allyship and solidarity in the book. And um, and I, Susan, I take your I take the critique that the metaphor of allyship can could be troubling because it sort of it seems to say you know there's a temporary alliance right that's like only serving our individual interests and you know we're only together until it doesn't serve us anymore. Um, but the context out of which that critique came is about like Black Lives Matter and having it you know, be a black led movement. And the idea that um, sort of, and then, you know, the idea that crystallizes out of that critique um, of allyship is that what really matters is that we're on the same page in terms of principles and um, what was the other principles and convictions. And so the question I have, <laughs> I guess we're getting down to it. Sorry, thanks for letting me take up some space. Um, is what more is required for solidarity? If we're not, you know, let's say we don't want to do allyship as a metaphor, but solidarity is the term that in the book is uh, more praised. Um, what more is required for solidarity than shared principles and theoretical commitments? And if we have time, I'd love to hear from you all when have we experienced real solidarity from others in our lives and what has it looked and felt like and when haven't we? Julia, you asked a lot of really good questions and I wanna to try to, and raise some important issues and I wanna to try to um, uh, try quickly to answer them. Um, you know, I, I don't see your argument that, uh, you know, focusing on social rights um, leads us back to liberalism at all. Um, when I say that voting rights are more important than pronouns, I'm talking about priorities, okay? Um, if the fascists take over the U.S. Congress, um, you know, the first people who are going to be in line is, uh, you know, anybody who cares about using a particular pronoun rather than another. And to somehow, you know, they're, they're just any any serious activist or even serious voter uh, has to think about priorities, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, you said, who are the woke? And I, I'll give you a short answer. Anybody who puts positionality over other criteria all the time. And I gave you the example of what happened with the Greens in Germany, but there are plenty of other um, instances. You can, mutatis mutandis, you can take that. Um, I bet everybody in this discussion knows, even if they don't want to say it in public, situations in which that has happened that in order to fill check a box um, about a formally marginalized group, a political decision has been made uh, that actually was not the right decision. This is not to say that we shouldn't always, when we're giving people jobs or letting them into organizations or schools or whatever, that we shouldn't look as far as we can and as broadly as we can and check to make sure that we haven't simply 
you know, relied on people who've traditionally had positions of power, okay? But when the default assumption is it's got to be one of these, you know, four categories, you can get into a lot of trouble. And I want to give you an example. I'm sorry, Jeremy, but I really want to take a moment, and I probably should have done this at the beginning, to explain what moved me to go from learning from the Germans to this book? Um, I could make a living for the rest of my life off of learning from the Germans. It's been in two Chinese editions. The Taiwanese one is already out and the mainland is coming. I mean, it's I, I get asked every single week to talk more about this book whose basic thesis was that... Um, Germany had done a unique historical reckoning from which other countries could learn. Um, and the book was finished at the end of 2018. Um, so before the 20, uh, the 1619 project, it was sort of the first in a wave of um, discussions about looking at American crimes and how to do that. Um, Shortly thereafter, uh, a complicated political situation took place in Germany. I won't go into all the details, but by which um, a focus on German crimes, on Nazi crimes, led Germans to start uh, attacking, canceling, I mean, real McCarthyite shit. Um, anybody who criticizes the, the state of Israel, including a whole bunch of left-wing Jews like me and my friends, okay? Um, and we are in this fight to this day. I'm sitting here, I did an interview this <laughs> earlier this afternoon. Um, the claim is, and it's all about positionality, okay? And the positionality is, um, First of all, you have to listen to what the Jews say. Now, who are the Jews who are afraid of anti-Semitism? Well, there's the government, so there, there are official Jewish organizations. And since people don't know who to listen to exactly, um, they listen, of course, to the government of the state of Israel. They listen to a very, um, the very right wing official body that's supposed to represent Jews in Israel. But what that comes down to is they listen to the people who are most tribal and most emphasizing tribal suffering and um, past victimhood. OK, so that is the position in Germany that is now um, considered to speak for the Jews and um, a position like mine, which is, by the way, shared by, um, you know, more than half of American Jews, uh, about half of Israeli Jews, which is a universalist position that actually goes back into Jewish history and the Bible and says, hey, you know, you were strangers in the land of Egypt and therefore you got to protect the stranger or protect the minority. Um, those of us who are worried about fascism in Israel are considered to be anti-Semitic, okay? And uh, so I've been, this has been basically, you know, the main focus of my own political activism for the last two and a half years. Meanwhile, I have watched what strikes me as disturbingly similar developments in the United States where people of color who are not convinced that um, you know everything that's problematic in the culture is a result of white supremacy, get called out as conservative or Uncle Toms or whatever. They're not being taken particularly seriously. Um, and uh, you know, it's the voice that most emphasizes the marginalized group's past suffering is the voice that counts, okay? And I, I mean, I basically wrote this book because I was seeing, it's 
much more dramatic and you can't draw exact parallels, but um, it's, um, it's a dangerous slide that I am trying to fight in Berlin and I'm quite worried about in other places as well. I hope that's illuminating. Yeah, I, I, I thought your discussion of um, the nuances of, of, of just having a complex position as a Jewish person in Germany on Palestine was one of the most illuminating examples of the book. Um, I have a cousin who's an American academic um, in Germany, and this is something that we have talked about a lot. Um, I think where the slippage for me is, is that, so yes, the, you know, that, that positionality is the only thing that matters in this black and white way. That's clearly troubling and problematic. I don't always see the connection between that and sort of a more wholesale rejection of the more complex theories and frameworks that have been bastardized to get that simple view of positionality. And so, and to the, and then, you know, tracing us back to, you know, voting rights versus social rights, like, I guess it would be helpful to have a clarification in the book that not the only, it's not just that leftists care about social rights in addition to um, political rights um, that distinguishes them, but, you know, we still have a hierarchy of things that matter where it's the political over the social, because that did not clearly come across in the um, characterization of the left to me. Um, but I don't see, I don't see that simple black and white um, understanding of positionality in the, the advocacy work around language um, or around a complexity, yeah. like a complex understanding of what it means to be in solidarity with the community where like positionality yeah. is part of that picture, but it, it's not the only thing, but it's in there. And so I'm, I guess <laughs> positionality has also been, um, you know, has been reduced. There's been this reductive understanding of positionality. So why, along with universalism, why don't we reclaim a complex understanding of what it means to account for positionality? Well, can, that can I, can I add to this too? Um, just just because we're, we're moving into the last couple of minutes of the discussion, we have about, maybe about 15, but hard cut. Um, I mean, another another thing that I liked about Julia's question, and um, I, I I was hearing it in the background of Catherine's question, and I hear it in when I read Steve Vogel's work. Um, and actually, I was hearing it in what would be required to meet Steve Rich's challenge about reconciliation at the end. I was hearing more a problem with practices and with the what Ranciere calls the the um, the kind of the system of the visible, which is that you know in the kinds of the kinds of the kinds of situations Susan um, you're referring to, where positionality gets reduced, simplified, and it ends up being quite destructive. Actually, um, you're dealing with these high visibility situations where there are very thin um, practices of people being able to work out. The kinds of complexities that Julia Gibson was just talking about. And in the com organizing communities, I think Julia is talking about, insofar as I've experienced them as well in leftist organizing in Cleveland, um, there are very rich and deep practices of relationships between people. Um, there's ample time and ample opportunity for people to work through these issues. And then you get, you know, a quote not from Foucault, but from Wittgenstein that to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. And when someone is able to drop certain kinds of linguistic utterances in a space where they make sense, what's really going on is the entire practice and the entire form of community is different. 
But in the examples you're talking about, Susan, these are all very media conscious, social media conscious and mass media conscious environments where things are incredibly thin relationally. People don't have time, like we even here are having to cut time off. And where basically the forms of accountability that should be there between people in deep democratic discourse just aren't available because the practices of politics, this just goes back to something Steve said earlier, are just so thin. So, I mean, I'd also just like to add that to what Julia was saying. I mean, why not focus on the loss of really deep, rich democratic practices rather than harping on kind of these kind of these reduced principles or these these kind of bastardized principles? Well, look, I'm all for, I mean, the, the way you're describing the um, organizing community in Ohio sounds wonderful. Um, and I'm all for there being more such uh, more such groups and communities. Um, the problem is sometimes one does have to, you know, whether it's a matter of time or not. I know, for example, that the Greens spent months or arguing and you know behind the scenes about who to put up for chancellor. Right, but they were thinking they, about how it looked. No, they That's weren't. That's the problem. The, yeah, the contact point was thin, right? No, they were deeply thinking that, you know, we're committed to feminism. We're committed to overturning patriarchal structures. Let's not just, you know, do what people have done so many times before and take the guy and maybe Annalena Baerbach is going to turn out to be better than you know, we think she is. I mean, you know, that's so, so it, it, it wasn't a matter of time. They had to choose one or the other and they chose the wrong person. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is that my uh, uh, American friend who's most involved in the social justice work on the ground uh, happens to be Jewish um, and blonde and blue eyed. She worked for many years in Mississippi. I mean, before it was called DEI, I have seen her, actually this was described in the book, Jeremy, and learning from the Germans. I have seen her, um, you know, uh, talk to a hundred Mississippi police chiefs and get them to rethink the way that they deal with race and policing, okay? She's enormously good and enormously effective. And um, she's doing fine now. She left I mean, the institute basically that she was working for in uh, Mississippi crumbled, but um, she's gone into uh, business as a as a you know private DEI consultant. She's doing fine. She's got lots of clients, but um, there were plenty of organizations that she would have liked to work for who just simply said. Uh, wrong optics. We cannot have a blonde, blue-eyed woman um, doing uh, social justice and, and racial discrimination training. And I've got to say it's, it's their loss because I spent, um, I mean, this was doing the last book, I spent the better part of a year um, following people around who were doing these kinds of uh, this kind of community work in its infancy. And um, she's the best I ever saw by a long shot, okay? So it's stuff that happens in lots of places. I don't know if that answers um, or makes anybody uneasy. I mean, about the way that things are running. I'm, I mean, I'm sure that at its best, um, people think long and hard about, you know, balancing somebody's, I'm gonna call it tribal, um, <laughs> you know, um, but if you'd rather, I'll call it positionality. Um, but this is actually the question. If James Baldwin can use positionality, sorry, can use tribal and everybody thinks that's fine, that's also a problem for me, okay? That is either you've got to criticize James Baldwin's use of the term 
Or you've got to say, well, if we lo all love Baldwin and he can do no wrong. I mean, I love Baldwin too. It's not that I think that there are particular wrongs he could. But those, so those know. words though, like whatever we call those concepts, like those, those are different things. So like the idea that we have this us versus them or like, you know, in group kind of thing, that's different from the idea that, so that separates, right? Like that's like putting up walls and not allowing relationships or acknowledging relationality. But positionality at its best is about interrogating how we relate to each other and to power and through power each other. And so it's action. And then from there, building different kinds of relationships. And so it's it can be this reductive thing, but it can also be a way to just take stock of like, where am I? Where are we? How do we relate to each other now? How can we relate to each other better? Um, how can I do the work with you? How can I understand you? How, how can we understand each other? All of that is relationship building. It's not like an us versus them kind of project. You know, I'm I'm all for that. Sorry. Oh, I, I was going to ask if I could break in on that point just just for a second. It's so um, it's related actually to the question that I thought was a great question Julia asked earlier about you know what is what is solidarity and, and what's the difference between solidarity and allyship and I had uh, I had asked a question um, just in in my written comments about what would it mean for the book to be addressed to the to the victims of of history that are supposedly the the objects of the of the woke's critique of the present and the objects of the left's critique as 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 well and so it, it what it all made me think about was this whether we're talking about solidarity or allyship it seems to me that the critical issue is risk. And that if you're not sharing risk, it's not going to matter very much to a person who's actually in a position of vulnerability, right? So Richard Kallenberg has this really great article about white suburbs and the, you know, Black Lives Matter signs in the front of in the front of their, um, you know, out by their front porches, with their with their restrictive zoning laws that don't allow anything but single family housing to be to be built, and they might be right next to to poor urban and urban uh, neighborhoods, right? So this this is like this is the problem of of the lack of shared risk. That for someone, I'll just I'll just take myself, right? For an African American person descendant of slaves in the United States, when I hear terms like solidarity and allyship being used in this way, what I think is, what are you talking about? You can always leave. You can always walk away. You're always safe, right? In in ways that others are not. And so those concepts are for for that. I don't know. I don't use this word except in chess. But for that positionality, <laughs> um, I'm not sure, I hope I'm using it right. For that particular positionality, this distinction doesn't matter, right? What matters is the person who will move themselves, right? The white person who will move themselves into a poor black neighborhood. That's a different person than the person who says, I stand for equality for black people. So I agree with you. And I think that's a good criterion to use, uh, Stephen. But um, I, I think part of my problem with the term allyship is not only, as Julia was pointing out, that it suggests temporary shared interests. It suggests that political activism is a matter of interest rather than principle. That is, the idea that um, you know people of color should oppose racism because it's against their interests. You know, is I mean. That's then very fundamental, not because it's wrong. And, you know, I mean, I have friends of color who also um, will call out uh, racism against white people, among other friends of theirs. And it certainly exists. Um, you know, so the question is do you think racism is wrong? Or are you simply standing up for your tribe? and your interests, and then allowing other people, for whatever reasons, to stand up next to you. And I, that's my problem with 
allyship. But I, I, I like your way of, of getting around it. I think putting some um, skin in the game is a you know good American um, metaphor is the way to uh, show it. Certainly more than more than many. Can I ask just a really quick follow up question then on on racism? So doesn't it matter then whether or not we can have a universalistic definition of racism? In other words, if, if racism is itself as a set of as a set of structures and consequences is so particularized, does that make it difficult for us for people of difference, people of different positions to be able to come together and say, we share a commitment against racism. No, I don't think racism is actually difficult to define at all. I think racism is simply the, you know, from any point of disparaging to exclusion to murder of people on the grounds of their ethnic background. I, and I, I just think in any time you do that, you're being a racist. I don't think that's difficult at all, and you can apply it wherever you find it. We have one more minute to a hard cut. Uh, is there anybody who has been having burning desire to interject at this point? Susan, do you have any last thoughts you want to Sure. No, I, I mean, I just really do want to thank all of you for, for very thoughtful questions that I've learned from. And, uh, you know, this is the problem with writing a book and um, is that um, once you start, even, even though I showed it to a bunch of people in manuscript, once you actually start talking about it, people come up with interesting things that you think, gosh, I should have gone into that more. Maybe there'll be a second edition. Um, not sure. But if there is, um, um, I want to thank you all for uh, adding to it.